top of the morning to you. This is Taki Ta. Today we are looking at another episode of Epic History TV. This is the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's marshals. This is the first part of a multiple part series from Epic History. And again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creator. Go give Epic History TV the love and support that they well deserve. And again, as always, if you have any other future video topics that you'd like to watch together, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. Let's get started. Because Napoleon's marshals were of the toppest class and really in the whole entirety of French society, uh, other like only second to really his family. His, his the, the other princes and his brothers that were also parts of other kingdoms that he would install. Uh, they were really the Terror top, belly, top tier. Decus Pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. And even though they were generals, they were. It was also still a civil. Uh, it it wasn't just uh, military. It was also civil responsibilities as well. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolised by a Marshal's baton. Oh, the, baton. the title was abolished during the French Revolution, as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. Hmm. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. That year he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. Eight more were created in the years that followed. Damn the marshals that. outranked everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes and ministers of state. Yeah. They came from every background, sons of aristocrats and innkeepers, professional soldiers, and those who'd learned on the job. Yeah, and that's one of the, also the biggest things is that he would pull them from all different parts of newly annexed territories and really based on merit rather than previous nobility. Because, I mean, it is the succession of the French Revolution where it's not good to be a, a monarchist. Old school Republicans and Bonaparte loyalists. The youngest just uh, half the age of the oldest. Who? And though Marshall was only was 34. Wow, for some reason I thought he was older. I mean, he's that's young, dude, to be like doing the shit that Davu was doing like at the time, like that's that's pretty young. And he he was one of Napoleon's best generals, too. It's a civil title, not strictly a military rank. The men known to the army as Les Gros Bonnets, the Big Hats, were mm. arguably the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant, and flawed group of military commanders in history. Yeah, and the French were very notorious for having some fancy garb and big hats. Oh, the right. most favoured were showered Mariotti. with titles and wealth. But the price too was high. Half were wounded. Three were killed or died of wounds. Two were executed. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Port, former Chief Historian of the French hmm. Army. First, a thank you to our sponsor, Call of War. Generals served in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. Hmm. Bertrand, Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who commanded 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. He's one of his best friends, too. Clausel, a veteran commander of the war in Spain. Dessay, Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. Hmm. Gérard, 
one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814, made a marshal by King Louis-Philippe in 1830. Oh. Goudon, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Mm. Junot, who first served with Napoleon at Toulon in 1793, probably committed suicide after his fall from favour in 1813. Mm. La Salle, the Hussar general, among the best light the cavalry Hussar. commanders of the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, of, the, of the biggest cavalry battle of all time, basically. Like, it was... Yeah, like, up until that point, it was the biggest cavalry charge ever. Like. Killed at Wagram, age 34. Maison, who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, made marshal by King Charles X in 1829. Oh, it's not wrong. Nonsuti, the heavy cavalry commander who died of wounds and exhaustion, oh, aged yeah. 46. And I, I think he's the one that took a cannon to the chest, to the shoulder. Oh, Saint Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. Van Damme, of whom Napoleon once said, if I had to invade hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. Hmm. And now, Napoleon's 26 marshals ranked in order of merit. 26. Marshal Perignon. Hmm. When Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, Four were honorary marshals, recognised for past service to France. Perignon was one of these. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief retirement, he was sent to Italy, and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi, huh. where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians, and that was really kind of before, I, I, yeah, this was even before Napoleon took charge. This was still with the Third Assembly. Perignon was badly wounded and captured. His appointment as Honorary Marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon, a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by emphasising continuity with the revolution by rewarding its military heroes. Yeah. Perignon... It's a good diplomatic move. I mean, when you're seizing the, the levers of power in its entirety, essentially, <laughs> it's good to make some new friends, too. Never held active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma, mm -hmm. and later Naples. His eldest son, Pierre, was a cavalry officer, killed at Friedland in 1807. Perignon retired in 1813, but refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815, and was stripped of his marshal's baton. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. 25. Marshal Brune. Brun was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. As a fiery republican, and former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges Danton, his support was politically yeah. useful for Napoleon. And Danton, you don't want to get on the bad side. Napoleon. Brun joined the army during the Terror, the most extreme period of the revolution. His political connections ensured rapid promotion and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris, with the famous whiff of grapeshot. Huh. Brun then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early... I mean, that would be so devastating to, to go, like, to be just in the streets as like a citizen or like a revolutionary I guess and going like facing the army head on with cannon pointed at you and being shot at point blank with grape shot I mean that does not sound fun victories what? 
He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander and enthusiastic. I mean, it, it was the time of terror, too. So, I mean, everyone was just getting their heads chopped off anyway. Plunderer of Italian towns and churches. In 1798, he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland, while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes, wow. the equivalent of several million dollars today. Interesting. It was said that Brune's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. Oh, wow. The next year, he won his most important victory while commanding French forces in Holland defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castricum and saving France from invasion. Hmm. But a short, calamitous spell commanding the army of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brun was not fit for high command. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, where in 1804 oh, wow. he learned that he'd been made a marshal. Oh, weird. I mean, that like... I mean, yeah, it was just a political move, but... It's interesting to go send him to be an ambassador, like in some distant. I mean, you gotta put him somewhere, so I mean, might as well make use. But Brune's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self importance, did not make him a successful diplomat. He was recalled to France, but as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again, drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French emperor. Whether a deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious, and Brune was sacked. Brune spent the next seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814, and rallied to Napoleon when he returned from exile the next year. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brune was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered and tossed into the River Rhone. 24. Marshal Serrurier. Retained all characteristics. It's very of an infiltrate major. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognize for past service. Infiltrate major. In contrast to Brun, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and a stern disciplinarian. This background was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognised as assets to the new French Republic. By if, seven... If you're good at what you do, you're good at what you do, man. 1895, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy where his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname the Virgin of Italy. Huh. Serrurier was a reliable, if unspectacular, commander, who won yeah, an important those victory. Are, those are important guys to have on your team too, because they can stand strong when times get tough, and you can depend on them. At Mondovi, at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'etat. Oh wow, so like, seeing that is such a privilege of being noteworthy. It, just in times of old, where, like, you're worth more being ransomed than just executed. Of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command. But Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal and governor of Les Invalides, the retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. There, shortly before the fall of Paris in 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards, to prevent them falling into Allied hands. 23. Marshal Kellerman. Well, I think I was probably the boldest general who ever lived, and even I wouldn't have dared to take post there. 
Kellerman was another honorary marshal, the oldest at 68, and famed throughout France as the saviour of the revolution. A career soldier from a middle-class background, he'd seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. At the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Régime. But at Valmy, in September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Centre stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history that saved the infant. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it kept them from getting completely annihilated and having it be re-establish the monarchy from uh, Austria. French Republic. When the revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links and spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. Acquitted and restored to command, he was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy, when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer, then in favour of a rising new talent, General Bonaparte. Kellerman oh, later specialised in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as President of the Senate. His son, General François Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. Interesting. 22. Marshal Grouchy. His conduct was an unforeseeable as his army on the march had been struck. When Napoleon returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. Hmm. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution. It's interesting how history remembers you, not for the thousand deeds you did well, but for the one you did not. Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars, fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a dragoon division in Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He was praised by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Eylau, played an important yeah, role buying well. time for Napoleon at Friedland, okay. and expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. Right. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps and was wounded at Borodino. Huh. He survived the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. Oh, wow. He I mean, that... That's a testament to how devastating that winter retreat out of Moscow was, where it took months to recover, to even be suitable for command again. Turned for Napoleon's 1814 campaign in France, and was wounded twice more. Grouchy wow. was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign, and commanded Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. It's cool they all have portraits, too. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Prussians to prevent them joining up with Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Two days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders, rather than march to join Napoleon, and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. Yeah, but I mean... Communication is tough, and I mean, it's, there's no way he could get reliable information on that, in the heat of battle like that, where he was following orders, and probably figured Napoleon could stand, hold his ground, while he pursued the side that he was 
tasked with. Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair, not least because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to show initiative, and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Yeah. Nor should one blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grande Armée's best cavalry generals. Yeah. Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape oh, wow. royalist reprisals, but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. Interesting. Tw yeah. Flew, fled to America, huh? 21. Marshal Monsey. He was an honest man. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. But then came the French Revolution. Most that French officers everything. were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. The result was that three quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reaped the benefit with meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monsey was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish, on what was admittedly a relative backwater of the Revolutionary Wars. In 1797, he was dismissed for alleged royalist sympathies but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. Right. By his own admission, Monsey was a sensitive officer. Honest, honourable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. Napoleon was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804, as part of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed Inspector General of the Gendarmerie, France's militarised police force, and spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, operating in the south of the country with mixed success. In 18... I mean, yeah. The Span Spanish campaign was was a brutal, it was a brutal guerrilla war. No nine, he was replaced by General Junot, and returned to France. Yeah, and when the tide's starting to turn, I mean, you got to put like your, some of your best guys to even just hold hold things to, from going into chaos down in the. In Spain. Monsey's finest hour came in the dying days of the Empire, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defence wow. of the French capital. There you go. In 1815, the restored hmm. King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monsey to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Wow. Monsey regarded Ney as a hero for having saved so many French lives in Russia and refused, declaring, if I am not allowed to save my country nor my own life, then at least I will save my honour. After That's commendable. After a short spell in prison, Monsey was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St Helena in 1840. Okay. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monsey announced, and now, let us go home to die. Wow. 20. Marshal Poniatowski. Uh, this narrator has got the names down, man. I cannot pronounce most of these. What? <laughs> Prince Josef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army, even serving as aide-de-camp to Emperor Joseph II himself. Huh. In 1789, he transferred to the Polish army with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by yeah. its rapacious neighbours, Russia, Prussia I mean, that was, and Austria. That was basically, a, a, like, defending against that was almost futile. I mean... You got three 
pretty savvy countries all around you. I mean, it's and it's flat plains. Poland's fairly like pretty much flat. Doesn't really have much national defense. So by 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Prussia in 1806, Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Sombre, serious and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When right. war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish Fifth Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically throughout the campaign motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. But by the end of the retreat, Fifth Corps had been virtually destroyed. Poniatowski yeah, I mean, that retreat devastated everyone. ...remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813, and was given command of the Polish Eighth Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon, in recognition of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. Poniatowski right. was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honour. Well, he and him. his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rear guard. Yeah. I mean, that Battle of Leipzig, man. The, the Battle of Nations. But their only escape route, a bridge over the Elster River, was blown up too soon. Yeah. Badly wounded, Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river. But he was swept from his saddle and drowned. He had been a marshal for just four days. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. I mean, you did what you could with what you have, where you are. But Poniatowski's legend lived on, a model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. Marshal Jourdain. As a young French private, Jourdain saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War, but he then caught oh, a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. When the French Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit fought at the battles of Jemap and Honschauter, and was rapidly promoted to general. I didn't, in, I didn't know he fought in the American War. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable for the French army's use of balloon reconnaissance the first effective use of an aircraft in military history. Interesting. Jourdan... I mean, that's... Well, you're all right. All right. ...became oh. a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalised France's policy of mass conscription. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, but his fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. When Joseph became King of Spain in 1808, Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. 
but the situation in Spain would prove beyond Jourdan's military skills to solve. He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals in Spain, theoretically under Jourdan's command, but who repeatedly ignored his orders and openly questioned his competence. Hmm. Marshal Soult. And that's not something you want as a marshal. Right. In Andalusia was a prime offender. Too many chefs in the kitchen. While Marshal Victor's insubordination at the Battle of Talavera contributed directly to the French defeat. Struck by another bout of ill health, Jourdan went home to recover. Two years later, he returned to Spain. But at the Battle of Vitoria in 1813, he and King Joseph were outmaneuvered and decisively beaten by Wellington, leading to the collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jourdan never held a major command again, but his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognised and respected. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Join us for part two, when we'll continue the countdown. Yeah. Let me know your thoughts on these eight, because uh, we're just getting started. And as always, let me know your thoughts of which of these eight you like the most. And as always, I will see you on the next one. Cheers.